All right. So, uh, uh, let's uh, continue where we left off. Uh, and um, so we have um, seen how, to, uh, how in various ways you can think about, recollect the uh, Buddha. Uh, this is the way the Buddha himself recommends that we remember the Buddha. And so it's kind of good to use that as a template, but really it is up to all of us to find ways of doing this in a way that means something to us, because everyone is a bit different. They were able to relate to the Buddha in different ways. And so this will kind of vary depending on the person. So these are just some of my ideas. Then you kind of make out of it what you think will work for you, see what happens. And then if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then uh, we do go for the next one instead. Uh, we'll have a look for the next one very soon. Uh, so this is the idea. So when that works, yeah, when the uh, kind of the idea of the Buddha kind of gets uh, clear, then this is supposed to be the consequence of that. Uh, and if this is not the consequence, then it means you haven't really you know, tapped into the potential of uh, Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the Buddha. So this is what's supposed to happen. When a noble disciple recollects the Buddha, the realized one, the Tathagata, the mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. Now, so let me just check here what not full of means, because that's kind of a, a critical, critical word there. Yeah. Uh, ah, better put this. On. Okay. So what is not full of? Uh, because this is, uh, this matters. Uh, so, uh, Little words are often very useful, may not seem like much, but actually uh, may be critical. Uh, so, uh, where are we? Mahanama Sutta, Bhikkhu Sujato translation. Uh, uh, ah, okay, so Raga Pariyutitan, so it means like, it's more like overwhelmed by, or uh, etc. I'll enlarge this again so everyone can see what's going on. Ah, it's more like it. So here you have the word. This is overwhelmed. The, the, the full love, that's what he has translated by, the, by that one. Pariyutitang means like enveloped or, or um, yeah, so full of is kind of ballpark, okay. But um, it basically means you haven't got much desire, greed, and uh, delusion. That's what it basically means, uh, anger or delusion. Uh, and the reason for that is because when you think about the Buddha in the right way, uh, your mind is inclined towards the Dhamma. Yeah? Your mind is kind of pointing towards wholesome qualities uh, at that particular time. And it's not really compatible with all of these negative qualities. Uh. And so the kind of mind that thinks about the Dhamma in the right way, that gains inspiration in the Dhamma, will not be able to have the, uh, the negative states at the same time. Uh. So this is why this is like a purification of the mind, if you like, when you think about these things in the right way. It basically means that you understand the Dhamma at that particular point. Uh, yeah? You know what's going on. You know what wholesomeness is, unwholesomeness is. Uh, and so your mind is not capable of harboring these negative qualities. Uh. Yeah, so that's kind of the idea here. Yeah? They, they, it's almost like there are two opposites. Uh, the qualities of the Buddha, when you understand what those qualities are, the mind automatically rejects the other things because you have that insight into the Dhamma at that particular point. Uh, even though it may only be temporary at that time, you sort of understand what this is about. Uh, that makes sense to anyone? Huh? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, okay. Sometimes you don't know whether something makes sense or not. Uh, so you're just uh, a bit uncertain here. Uh. So then, then what happens? Uh, at that time, the mind is unswerving based on the realized one. Uh, and uh, the idea of here, the uh, unswerving here is uh, ujuka. Ujjo, the mind is ujjo. It means it is straight. Yeah? And it, it, in other words, it, it is not crooked. Uh, the opposite of ujjo is a mind is crooked. And a crooked mind is a mind that is full of defilements. That's how it is defined uh, in the suttas. Uh, so unswerving, straight. It doesn't swerve left and right and center. It doesn't go into kind of all kind of byways and stupid uh, dead ends and all of these kind of things. Uh, it is kind of hit going in the right direction. The mind is... Uh, um, Kind of looking to the goal, the purpose of the path, they're yeah, heading towards the goal, uh, not swerving, straight. The word ujju is uh, actually related to the English word straight. Uh, in Sanskrit, it's rujju. 
And Rujo is kind of sounds more like straight, doesn't it? With the R in there, or right, very closely related to the word right as well. So the mind is right based on the Buddha. The mind is straight based on the Buddha. So this is the idea of Ujjo. So this is what is uh, going on. Yeah. So this is, um, you, in other words, you have an appreciation of the Dhamma, if you like. Yeah? A noble disciple who whose mind is unswerving or straight, uh, finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching, yeah? and finds joy connected with the teaching. Yeah? Yeah? So the, um, when your mind, when you have an appreciation of the Dhamma, that means that you are inspired by the meaning. What is inspiring here? The word here that you find here is Atta Veda and Dhamma Veda. And the idea of the word Veda, Veda is... Uh, uh, also related to the word Vedana, which is kind of feeling, yeah, on the path. But it's also related to the word uh, uh, Vijja. Vijja, we saw before, is like the Te Vijja, the three higher insights on the Buddhist path. So it has this mixture of feeling and understanding, yeah, which is kind of the idea of Veda. And uh, in English, the way that you talk about the mixture of feeling and understanding, uh, one way of doing that is by the word inspiration, uh, yeah, if you are inspired by something, it means that often you understand what is going on, and that understanding leads to, wow, this is really cool, and this is nice, and you feel kind of uplifted at the same time. Uh, inspiration is a mixture of understanding and uplift. Uh, this is exactly what you see here with the meaning, the atta and the dhamma, yeah, this uh, mixture of uh, uplift and understanding coming at the same time. Uh. So this is uh, the idea, hey, atta veda. Dhamma Veda. And uh, so you, your mind finds this natural inspiration as a consequence. So, uh, what does it mean to be inspired by the meaning? What does inspiration and the meaning actually mean? And the uh, Pali word Atta means uh, meaning, but it also means the goal of something, uh, yeah? the purpose, uh, where you're heading, uh, the aim of something. Uh, so, inspired by the aim. What does the aim mean? Aim is where the path is going, right? What is the purpose of the path? Uh, where we're heading to the results of all the practice? This is kind of the idea of aim here. Huh? So inspired by where you're going. You understand actually, suddenly you get this feeling, this glimpse of insight into what the purpose of this whole path is. Uh, the path is moving towards uh, uh, freedom. Uh, yeah, the kind of getting out of the prison. The path is moving towards joy. The uh, path is moving away from dukkha. Uh, the path is moving towards the stability, the overcoming of all the uh, impermanence of the world. Uh, yeah, you get this feeling for what actually is happening on the path. Uh, suddenly you get this uh, clarity about what this is all about. Uh, and that sense of purpose is, of course, it's inspiring. Uh, because suddenly your life has a meaning that it never has had before. Uh, suddenly things kind of come together in a, in a new way. Uh, and because you are inspired in the purpose uh, of the path, the purpose of the teaching, uh, you also are inspired by the teaching themselves because the teachings uh, is the thing that leads in that direction. Uh, now the Dhamma is like the source, uh, and from that source come the result. The result is, of course, uh, what happens as a consequence of practicing these things. Uh, these are source and consequence. is a way of thinking of Atta and Dhamma. They yeah, have the source and where the source actually leads. Uh, this is why, this is how you then feel inspired in these teachings and the meaning. Yeah. And uh, then... Of course, from that inspiration, uh, it is not very far to the idea of joy. Yeah, joy connected with the Dhamma arises from that. Uh, because inspiration, then a little bit more, and maybe at this point you start watching the breath or whatever, you bring the contemplation in with your meditation. This is kind of the idea here. Uh, then it can give rise to joy. Uh, you feel glad. Uh, you feel mudita. You feel piti, maybe. Uh, dhamma piti. What is the Pali here? That's a good question there. Uh. Pamoja, Dhamma Pamoja. Dhamma uh, Upasamhitang Pamoja. Okay, so Dhamma, uh, so, so uh, joy connected with the Dhamma. That's exactly what it says here. So why don't I just read the English translation? <laughs> so that's good. Uh, yeah, so the joy connected with the teaching because you understand where this is all heading here. This is kind of the idea here. Yeah, and that, uh, so this happens more or less automatically here. Uh, when you reflect on the Buddha in the right way. Huh? This is kind of the idea here. Huh? So, um, yeah. 
So what happens next? And what happens next? You just saw that before. And I think you know that already. Yeah, so when you have the Pamoja, when you're joyful, then rapture springs up. And at this point is often the point where you kind of move over to meditation proper. And you have allowed yourself to be inspired by the recollection of the Buddha. And now maybe you join that with the breath contemplation. You contemplate the breath. You go with the breath. And then because the breath has this additional quality of an understanding of the Dhamma, joy arises as a consequence. And so this is what kind of the point of what I was trying to say before you start out your meditation. At a certain point in your meditation, you need a bit of uplift, you need a bit of extra energy, you need some more happiness in the meditation. So you do a kind of a brief contemplation. You just remind yourself very gently who the Buddha is, uh, that you have the Buddha as your teacher uh, that the Buddha has given the world these marvelous teachings. And sometimes, because you have contemplated this in the past, you know what this means, and automatically some sort of uplift of the mind happens. A brightening of the mind, a joy of the mind comes as a consequence of that. Yeah, so then uh, you bring that in, the meditation is already there, you give it a boost, you go back to the breath, and then this process happens more easily because you have added some of the qualities required for this process to work properly. Huh? You're joining the joy and the breath together into one kind of uh, 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 complete, yeah, complete meditation object. Huh? And when the mind is full of rapture, uh, piti manasa, or when the mind is rapturous, uh, the body becomes tranquil. This again, you have the kind of the stages, one thing leading to the next one. Huh? And then when the body is tranquil, uh, the person feels bliss. Uh, and when they're blissful, the mind becomes stilled. Uh, yeah, immersed in samadhi has uh, Sujato, I prefer to stilled. I think it's an easy way of thinking about the idea of samadhi. Uh, this happens then as a consequence of this. Uh, and again, shows you the power and importance of joy on the path. Uh, the joy connected with the breath gradually takes you all the way to samadhi. This is why it is so important uh, and where it comes in there. So, uh, yeah, then what happens? Then what happens is the following here. And what happens is that uh, this is called the noble disciple who lives in balance uh, among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, so the idea here is that you are balanced because your mind is in balance. Uh, your mind is not being pulled in one way or pushed in another direction. You don't have ill will and anger and rejection and attachment and all of these kind of things. So your mind is nice and balanced. Uh, untroubled in the sense that you have less dukkha than the average person because of uh, uh, this ability to attain samadhi. The mind is uh, in a nice space. You enter the stream of the teaching and you develop the recollection of the Buddha. So that is uh, in uh, brief the Buddha Nusati how to do the recollection of the Buddha and the consequences of doing it. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is kind of how this is uh, explained in this uh, Sutta, the Mahanama Sutta. What do you think? Can do? Cannot do? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, occasionally, not always. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So you have to, again, so the idea here, remember that this is all things to be developed, right? Uh, it doesn't happen easily. No. Uh, many people will find it uh, difficult to develop the joy in the Buddha, and that's to be expected. Don't expect miracles to happen and you'll have lots of joy. The Buddha, wow, joy straight away. No, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Uh, yeah, you have to develop these uh, ideas, develop these perceptions. Uh, and when they become developed, that's when they work and have this kind of power uh, Fortunately, the good news is that there are other ways of giving rise to these uh, joys. Uh, and so now we're going to have a look at some of these other ways. Uh, so the next one is, uh, no surprise, is the recollection of the Dhamma. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the Dhamma, the teaching. Yeah. So um, let's just stop there for a moment. Uh, so there's always, as I mentioned before, there's always a sequence in these things. Uh, Everything in Buddhism has a structure. Everything has a sequence. Things are never kind of random. So when you see like the five aggregates or the five hindrances or you see the noble eightfold path or you see the six recollections, 
everything comes in a certain structure. Yeah, one thing leading to the other one, one being more important than the next one. And it's exactly the same thing here. The Dhamma is secondary. The Dhamma emerges from the Buddha. The Dhamma only exists because the Buddha exists in the world. Yeah, that's why it is there. And so if you understand the Buddha, you also understand the Dhamma. But if you don't quite grasp the Buddha, you can still understand the Dhamma, perhaps. So if the first one doesn't work, at least the second one works. And you can see why. And the reason why is because the Dhamma is still available in the, in the world today. So you can relate to it much more easily, maybe, than the Buddha, who passed away two and a half thousand years ago. And he's more like a, a theory, more, almost more, sometimes, unfortunately, a bit more like a myth or a legend than a real person. But the Dhamma is much more real because it is available to us even now. And this is kind of great, yeah, because the Dhamma is at the end of the day just an expression of the Buddha's enlightenment. So if you read the Dhamma and you understand what it is about, in a sense you are in the presence of the Buddha because this is what the Buddha is. Yeah? He is these teachings. These are an expression of what he is doing. So just by reading this, you are already, in a sense, also taking a step up the ladder and going back to the Buddha at the same time. So these are not kind of exclusive contemplations. In a sense, they all come together in a certain way. So what is it about the Dhamma that is so marvelous? And I'm going to read out in a second how this is explained in the Sutta and how is it explained everywhere. But it's sometimes it's good to contemplate a li little bit before you actually look at the textbook answer. Yeah? Because if you look at the textbook answer, your mind is already set in a certain way. Yeah? So I always think first and then afterwards look at the textbook answer. Don't just learn the textbook answer yeah? because that allows you to be more creative and imaginative with how you deal with the Dhamma. So reflecting a bit first is always useful. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, so yeah. So what is it about these teachings? And I, I was at a very interesting event uh, not so long ago. I was in Sydney. When I was in Sydney, I was vis visiting my friend, the Bhante Sujato. He, he can be quite a controversial monk in many ways and very interesting. Yeah. And he has done many, many kind of interesting things. He was one of the first people to... Uh, you know, to support the idea of ordination from bhikkhunis in the West and these kind of things. Uh, and he has, he's a very kind of strong personality. Have, has he been here? Uh, he's been here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. When was he last here? Uh, long time ago? Uh, oh, a long time ago. Okay, yeah. Should invite him back again. Come, come. <laughs> so he's, he's a very kind of, he's a very strong personality and very, uh, yeah, but also very, very, very bright, very intelligent person. And he can present the Dhamma in a kind of very interesting ways. And so we, so he has a, uh, He's one of the, most, the, I think, the person in the world who has translated the most suttas. I don't think anyone has translated more suttas than Bhante Sujato. So he, what he did was he decided he, you know, he has basically he's running this website called Sutta Central that you saw before. Yeah, that's kind of his baby. Yeah, so uh, monks don't have children, but they have websites instead. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was his, that is his baby uh, over there. Yeah. And. Uh, so um, this is what has been his kind of his life's work. And of course, he realized that if you're going to have a website, which is called Sutta Central, which means all the suttas are there, well, you've got to have the suttas, right? You can't just have the front page and no suttas behind it, otherwise it's kind of pointless. And so he wrote to Wisdom Publications. Wisdom Publications is the a company in the US that publishes most of the suttas. Usually the translations of Bhikkhu Bodhi is what they have there. And so he wrote to them and said, oh, you know, it's... Uh, this copyright business on the suttas is a bad idea. Yeah? The Buddha gave the suttas to the world, and then we go and have copyright on those suttas? You must be joking. Yeah? These are could be free for everyone to have. Why, how can you have copyright on these suttas? It doesn't make any sense. And I, I think he's right. How can you copyright the word of the Buddha? We're going we're gonna to keep, you know, hold the word of the Buddha for ourselves. Everything should be free of copyright. The reason they do it is because, of course, they want to cover their expenses and so on and so forth. And uh, fair enough to some extent. But there comes a point when these things become like a profit venture. You do these things for profit. And I think that is where it becomes problematic. And apparently they use the suttas of the Pali Canon to subsidize some of the other kind of Buddhist books, like the Mahayana books or whatever. They don't sell so well. The suttas sell better. And that's kind of not a good idea, in my opinion. Yeah, this is kind of where things start to go really wrong here. Yeah. And uh, so he wrote to them and said, "It's time for you to free up the suttas and kind of give, you know, and kind of give the right to everyone else, so we can put them on Sutta Central." 
And they told him, no. <laughs> That's what they said. We, we can't do that because of whatever reasons. And of course, he was not very happy with that. And so he said, okay, well, if that's the case, uh, I am going to have to translate all the suttas. Uh, and that's what he did. So he went off on an island outside of Taiwan called Chi Mei, a small little island. Uh, and he stayed there for two years. He had a, he has a supporter actually from, from Malaysia. Yeah, he's a Malaysian supporter. This Malaysian supporter has a little house on Chi Mei. And then uh, uh, that's where he went yeah, to be supported by this uh, uh, this fellow. Uh, and so he spent two years there, translated all the suttas, uh, and came back, and then the suttas were mostly translated uh, before mainly Kaya's. And then when he came back to Sydney, he continued translating. Uh, and so now he has translated the four mainly Kaya's and uh, also part of the Kudaka Nikaya, the, the, uh, uh, you know, this minor collection, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so uh, it is all there on Sutta Central uh, and so this is what he has done. And then, of course, there comes a point when you also want to... And then I translated the Vinaya Pitika. That was my job. Uh, so a bit unfair, yeah. He gets to translate the suttas. I translate the Vinaya. Right. <laughs> the suttas the are the real teachings, right? <laughs> and anyway, no, that's actually perfectly fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, um, th there comes a point when you want to publish these things. Yeah? So he then uh, put them on a, on a website where they are self-published, and you can go there and you can buy these books now in hardcover. And so we had an official launch. And that's what we had in Sydney when I was there, the official launch of this Tepitika hardcover. Yeah? And it was like this large collection of books, all the translations. They were quite amazing to see that, actually, when you see it. Uh, and so we had this cover, and this was done in a place called the... Uh, at the State Library of New South Wales, yeah, this kind of old, grand, colonial-style building in New, in, uh, in New South Wales, in the middle of Sydney. Sydney is a surprisingly large city. There's about five million people there. It's like a really big city. And so the center of Sydney is kind of where all the important buildings are, and there's a lot of beautiful parks around. It's all colonial-style building. And that's where we had this launch of Sita Central in one of their room, function rooms there. And then we had one of the people who was present was a, a fellow called Jeff Gallup, who used to be the premier of uh, Western Australia. Premier is like the prime minister of Western Australia. So he was there, he had to give a speech. And then um, there was a few other people there, and Bhattu Sujata was there, and I was there, and everyone. And of course, we all talked, right? We had a, and we had a kind of a discussion uh, about uh, you know, the, the, the suttas and everything. Yeah. And uh, what I said, and I, I, I was really proud of saying that, uh, I said that... Uh, uh, this is this launch of the suttas in English in Australia is the most important event in Australian history. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this is a kind of very Buddhist point of view, right? I'm not sure if every non Buddhist would agree with that, uh, but uh, I think it is. I think it is the most important uh, uh, event in Australian history. Why? Because these suttas. Uh, are about the very meaning of life. There is no literature in the world. Actually, what, what I said was an understatement. Yeah? The truth is that this uh, publication of this literature, uh, this literature is the most important literature in the history of the world. Uh, that is the reality of it. Uh, yeah. And because why? Well, because this is what gives you access to the highest insight into the nature of humanity. This is what gives you access into understanding the meaning of life. Uh, this is what gives you access to anything that is truly meaningful. There is no literature in the history of the world that actually is more important than this. And so once you start thinking like that, it's like, wow, yeah? I mean, maybe you read something that you find interesting, some kind of, uh, you know, whatever it might be that you read, and maybe it is exciting. Maybe you find some insight. Maybe you think Shakespeare, or okay, Shakespeare, he was a great author. Let's read Shakespeare to get some authors. But Shakespeare is like nobody compared to the Buddha. Right? Uh, it's not, not really all that interesting. Yeah. And any, even spiritual teachers in the history of the world, they cannot really, none of them is at, at the level of the Buddha, from the Buddhist point of view. Right? The Buddha is one who had the full understanding of what uh, human experience and a human um, situation is. And so once you kind of get that, then you start to understand what you're dealing with when you're dealing with the suttas. Uh, you're dealing with the most important literature in the history of the world. Uh, and then when you kind of turn the pages, it's like you start to shake a little bit. Yeah, oh, that's the most important words. And we'll be able to understand. Yeah, and you kind of feel a little bit excited and shaking and nervous about what you're about to read. Every word matters. Every word is really important. 
this is what I was saying before yesterday about the Dhamma, yeah, that uh, when you think about the Dhamma in this way, uh, the most important literature in the history of the world, uh, and you see what the Buddha says about this. Uh, yesterday I talked about the idea of svakato, well proclaimed, uh, yeah, what that actually means. It means that the Buddha sat down and really thought about this before he expressed the Dhamma. You can imagine what it is like to be the Buddha. It's actually very difficult. You have this insight into the nature of reality, and an insight is like one moment, yeah, one flash, bang, and this kind of picture yeah, of reality is like bang. And then you have to somehow express that one insight into words. I mean, the insight doesn't come with words, right? It's not, there's no words there. With the insight, it's just like one realization, and that realization is without any kind of... Uh, Commentary, words, and you have to express that. How on earth are you going to express the most profound understanding of uh, that, that can be had by a human being? How can you express that into words? You can imagine how hard it is. People already, before the time of the Buddha, they already had insight into samadhi. Samadhi already existed to some uh, to some degree, uh, and uh, that in, already is often considered beyond the scope of language. How can you express this kind of really unified, powerful states where you think you are God and you are kind of, there's no difference between you and God. You're unified with the universe. How can you explain this to anyone? This goes even beyond that. So how can you explain this? And so what you see is when you then go to the suttas and you read what the Buddha did, after his awakening, this is from the Udana, he would sit under the various trees for a while, contemplate what he had experienced, yeah? And that's where he thinks about dependent origination, all these kind of things, because that is kind of the crux of the Buddha's teachings, if you like. But it took the Buddha a long time to really evaluate what this was about, to express it in terms, to articulate it in a way that it could be passed on to people later on. So even for the Buddha, that took a while. yeah. And sometimes the Buddha would go on retreat. What would he do when he was on retreat? Well, I think he would maybe reflect on how is it best to articulate these things. Yeah, Maybe that was what, part of what he did at that time. Because it's not obvious how you go from that insight into articulating it. So this is kind of what the... So, and so all of this points to the fact that this is very carefully thought out by the Buddha. If you go to most contemporary teachers of, of uh, Buddhism, very often they, talk, they, they call it talking straight from the heart. But what straight from the heart means, means not very coherent, right? It means like, okay, it just comes out of you. But often it's a bit kind of random. It comes out in this way, it comes out in that way. And sometimes they contradict each other. And sometimes one person says this, the other person says that. And you wonder what is going on there. And uh, sometimes people say to me, oh, I prefer to read the modern books of modern meditation masters because it's much easier, Yeah. The Buddha, so difficult to understand. Let's, let's read, uh, you know, Ajahn Brahms, yeah, opening the door of your heart. Yeah, easier than reading the word of the Buddha. Okay, I agree. That, that book is easier. <laughs> it's just stories and jokes. Yes, of course, it's easy. Yeah. But uh, what we forget is that uh, maybe on the surface, it is easier. Yeah. On the surface, it is more poetic. Yeah. On the surface, it's more polished. Yeah. On the surface, it kind of... Uh, is aligned with our modern taste, what literature should be about, yeah, because it is more modern in a sense. But it is only on the surface that it is more beautiful. The Buddha warns us against this in the suttas, where he says, in the future there will be poets and poetry, and there will be disciples who have the Dhamma in, or in beautiful words and phrases. And, they, and the Buddha says, well, and then everyone will go to that. And that is what they will think is profound and worthy of listening to. And they will not go to the word of the Buddha, which is really profound and connected with emptiness, sunyata patisangyuta. Yeah, that will, they will bypass the word of the Buddha and go to these poets instead. And that's what everyone says. They say, oh, I prefer reading this teaching, that teaching, because it's so beautiful, yeah, so nice. <laughs> and it's okay to read these other teachers. There's nothing wrong with that. But actually, you're missing out on the really most important teaching of all, which is the word of the Buddha. That is where the real Dhamma is found. And if you don't go, go there, very likely you will miss out on the, some aspects of the real teachings and what the profundity of those teachings actually are. Sometimes people ask the question, well, what about when I die? Yeah, I get reborn. What happens then? How can I make sure that I will be a Buddhist also in my next life? How can I be a Buddhist deva? 
Yeah, you, you don't want to be a Christian deva, you want to be a Buddhist deva if you're going to be reborn in deva loka. How can I be a Buddhist deva? And there's a simple answer to that, and that is to understand the Dhamma as much as you possibly can, and also practice it as far as you can. And then you go reborn in the heavenly realm, and you listen to the devas, okay, one talks about Christianity, another about Islam, and then one talks about Buddhism. Yeah, this is my, this is kind of the one. Now it comes back to me, yeah? And you remember it because it is, you have been reading these things before. But to be able to remember it, to be able to make sense of it, you have to actually go to the word of the Buddha and not to go to all the idiosyncratic teachings of modern teachers. Because the word of the Buddha is what we all have in common. And when you go to the heavenly realm, that is what you're going to hear. You're not going to hear, uh, you know, uh, truckload of dung or good, bad, who knows, or, you know, opening the door of your heart. That doesn't exist. Maybe someday, but that is not the kind of the main thing, right? You have to go to the teaching of the Buddha. But that, <laughs> that, that one is... Uh, <laughs> there are quotes on the suttas in there. Just read the quotes on the suttas, yeah? It's full of nice little sutta quotes. Uh, so read those. Uh, then you'll be all right. Uh. <laughs> and don't, don't embarrass me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so the, the point is that if you really want to get into the Dhamma, this is where at the end of the day you have to go. And I, I recognize that sometimes it is a bit difficult to access. It is difficult because it is a bit repetitive. It is in a style that is different. Yeah, And this is one of the reasons why it is nice to do this kind of sutta come together or retreats or whatever you want to, want to call it, because it gives us a chance to look at these things a bit more deeply. That is very, very useful. So um, this is what these teachings are. Yeah? They are the most important literature in world history. Yeah? And this is what uh, um, we should remember when we have these teachings in our hand. But before we go on, let's do some more meditation together here. Yeah? Okay, so um, any comments, please, or questions, or whatever, please go for it. Mm. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Hi, nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. Um, Ajahn, you were mentioning about um, devas recalling their dhamma. So just wondering, right, as human, when we will be born, yeah. we can't remember anything. So, ah. But I guess as what Ajahn Brahm said, our inclination will reconnect us to the Dhamma. So, but why is it mm. that as a Deva, why do they recall past life so easily? Is it that their body is a bit different? or mm. Because I, okay, this is my family story. So many, many, many years ago, my, my late, grandparents, mm. they were Taoists. So they go to Chinese temples. Mm. And uh, we have supported this temple for many years and we, we trust that um, this temple is good. La. The, the Deva is there to help mankind. Mm. So uh, after my grandfather passed away, my grandmother visited this temple to consult the Deva on some matters. Mm. And this Deva... Um, told my grandmother a story. Uh -huh. He said um, one day his general came to inform him there was a deity or a fairy standing outside his palace wanting to seek his audience. Then um, he invited this deity into his palace mm. and, his, and this deity was introducing himself. He was saying he was so and so and he was under whose leadership. Mm. Then he said, his past life was actually my grandfather. Okay. So when he reborn in the heavenly realm, he recalled my grandmother and he visited her. Ah. And she saw he saw her crying at her dressing room. Okay. And he could also read her mind that she was um, worried about him ah. in his afterlife. But because my grandfather couldn't talk to her, so he and he knew that my grandmother visit visited the temple very frequently. Mm. So he asked a favor from the deva to relay a message to my grandmother. Okay. 
<laughs> and he said he said yeah. two things. He he wanted okay. to say two things to my yeah. grandmother. He said, uh, "Don't worry about me. I'm at a I'm at a very happy destination." Mm. So my my grandmother cried because um she had a lot of remorse la. She had a lot of argument with my grandfather, mm. and I guess it's my grandfather's way of forgiving her. Mm. So my question is, why why is it that? A day, my, my grandfather was a very simple uh, man. He, he wasn't a meditator. Yeah. But why is it that when he was he reborn as a deva, he could remember his past life and he could read, um, read my grandmother's mind? Yeah. And the second question is, if we were born as a deva, is it true that um, it's more difficult to practice the Dharma? Is it a myth? <laughs> is it is it that we must always come back as a human to practice? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, lots, that's very no, thank you for that story. It's a very nice story, Jerry. I really, I really like the story actually. Yeah. And uh, because this is what I was saying here yesterday, I was saying that you know when you sometimes you, you die and everyone is crying, but you're in, in heaven. I'm saying, don't worry about me. I'm fine. Just relax. Just enjoy your life. That's exactly what I was saying yesterday. It's kind of it fits really really well. You know, it's kind of this is great. Were you, were you here when I said that? Huh? Yeah, you were. So you heard that already. It's the same story, right? It's kind of beautiful. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of. So thank you so much for for re relaying that. Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, I think the uh, you know why do human beings lose the memory of past life, whereas devas? I think devas they probably only remember one life back. They remember when they were human, uh, or if they had a previous life as a deva, maybe maybe one life before that. Uh, but usually the deva life is so long that you actually. You forget that you were born eventually because it's so far back. You can't remember the beginning of your life anymore. And so you think you are eternal. That's kind of one of the problems of Devaloka because you can't remember the beginning. And then the Buddha comes and says, well, sorry, you guys, you're impermanent, actually. They say, what? We are impermanent? <laughs> they get really worried and they get afraid. And then they get a sense of urgency or whatever. So I think that is, I think the reason basically is that the kind of process of being born is quite traumatic, yeah. And your mind gets kind of kind of into this tiny little fetus, you know, and uh, it doesn't have, it kind of, you, the whole thing, the whole process is so hard. They say birth is dukkha, that's kind of the first noble truth, jati pidukkha. And that may be part of that thing, that actually this process of going through that whole thing, you cannot really retain your memories. Uh, that would be my guess. Uh, whereas for devas, you kind of, you die as a human being and you come bang, there you are, deva, look, oh, I'm a deva now. Uh, yeah. And so there isn't that traumatic process that you have to go through. Uh, so I think that might be, that's kind of, would be my guess as to what's going on there and how this works. So, um, so why could he read your grandmother's mind? I would say that uh, that's probably one of the just natural, again, natural powers of a deva. Yeah, they can kind of read minds more easily because they are, they are kind of more mind made than we are. They're not as hindered by material things as human beings are. So they have more ability to, uh, to do that, basically. It's just kind of what they, what they can do. Huh? So, uh, yes, I think it was actually, what, what, was another part of your question? What was the last thing you were asking about? Uh, right, okay, yeah, right. That, that's another important point. Yeah, I, I think it is a, a bit of a myth sometimes, to be honest, uh, because it doesn't say anywhere in the suttas that you can't practice as a deva. Uh, in fact, uh, the Buddha is a teacher of gods and humans. What's the point of teaching them if you can't, they can't practice? Uh, must be a reason, right? Uh, so I think that devas too, they can be kind or they can be nasty. Uh, yeah, and they can, uh, can they meditate? Uh, uh, probably, I, don't, I can't see why not. Uh, yeah, all we need for meditation is to focus on something and that collects the mind. Uh, so I don't know if they breathe. If they don't breathe, they have to focus on something else. Uh, maybe that was kasina meditation start in the deva loka because they can't follow the breath. So they have to use kasina meditation maybe. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just guessing. But there's always... The idea of meditation is just the ability to focus. Uh, and that would be, you know, you can do that wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh. So I think this whole idea that you can't practice in Deva Loka is, uh, is exaggerated. Uh. And uh, you also find in the suttas, Devas becoming stream enterers, right? Uh, you find that with Sakka, uh, Devinda, he becomes a stream enterer. So obviously, some certain things are certainly possible. And um, this idea that you should try to be reborn in the human realm that you often hear about, uh, I've never seen any evidence of that in the suttas. I don't know where that idea comes from, uh, but not from the Buddha, I think. The Buddha doesn't say that we should try to guide our rebirth at all. He says, you just, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens, really. 
And uh, so the best thing to do on the deathbed is just to chillax. Uh, yeah, relax and just enjoy it. Uh, see what happens. Uh, yeah, enjoy the journey, as they say. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of my my take on all of that. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think actually the, uh, I think where that comes from is because we uh, we are born in the Deva Loka and then we enjoy our life too much, too much coffee and too much, you know, <laughs> too, too much. <laughs> so there's a, there's a danger of indulgence, I think. Yeah. Perhaps that's where it's come from. But it, it... Um, that, I think that's where the idea comes from. Uh, but, uh, you know, you uh, I, that doesn't mean it is impossible to practice. It just means that, you need, you know, you just need to be... Uh, so, uh, you know, you just need to turn your mind in the right direction. That's why people, you know, they become stream mentors as, uh, as they as It shows that it's not impossible, uh, the fact that that happens. Uh, so I think that depends on how you incline your mind, uh, you know. So, um, I mean, there are people in this life who are very well off and doing really well, and they still become Buddhist monks. Yeah, and they kind of give up everything in their life. Uh, I know some people who are super duper wealthy that become Buddhist monks uh, and who are, you know, have everything in life and say, okay, enough. Who cares about all of this? Pick. Buddhist monk. That's kind of what happens. <laughs> and it makes sense, yeah, because it's kind of interesting. You look at human life and it isn't that great. It doesn't matter how much wealth you have, you know, you still have this, all the kind of problems that all, most of us have anyway. Yeah. People dying, heartaches and problems and the painful body and illnesses and cancer. That's kind of common to all humanity. A bit of extra money is not going to make a big, big difference. Yeah. And so we are just deluded, often we are deluded about the importance of things like being wealthy or famous or whatever. Actually, it is often very irrelevant to how much happiness you have. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Ajahn. Hmm. Um, I must say thank you very much for the very inspiring sharing about the Sutta and your promotion <laughs> on Sutta. <laughs> Yeah. I must confess that this mind, um, well, to me, Sutta is like literature, like Shakespeare's, which is a no-no for reading for this mind, despite my, my profession, right? Mm. But since I attended your Sutta retreats for some years now, yeah. or as I think last few years, except for COVID, right? That's the only time that I get closer to the Sutta. Yeah. But this time around the retreat, right? Yeah. This mind got very much inspired. Okay. So the yeah. question is, hmm. how do I start? <laughs> Where do I start? You see, yeah. as much as Buddha laid down his, his, his teachings to us in a way that it applies to the circumstances as and when he, he spoke or he shared. Yeah. And um, it was collected by, you know, a group of wise uh, practitioners and it is in different suttas. Mm. And from my understanding, my little understanding from your teaching, it's like, like for example, this uh, retreat two, right? Finding joy in the practice. And I noticed that you actually pick up the relevant excerpts from different suttas. So, mm. if for these super beginners, yeah. well, if I'm going to pick up one of the sutta, if we have so many different topics or areas mm. to read. Mm. But then, if I were to read, I'm very sure that I will be just reading like plain English. Yeah. Without the explanations that you have given and which really helps and shape a lot of like yeah. tunnel. So yeah. Yeah. So it depends. It, I would say it depends a lot about on the, how much time you have and all of these kind of things, you know. And most people I would agree are probably too busy to really read the suttas properly. It just takes too much time to really understand everything. And you know, you have a full life, you, you have children, and everything like that. No? A full-time job. Full-time job. Okay, that's probably probably that's probably more than worse than children. So you have a <laughs> that's like your child. So you have lots lots to do, right? And you're very, very busy anyway. And uh, so for most people, I think it is very hard to actually get into the suttas properly. And what you can do then is you can have like some, like a small collection of inspiring things, like on your night table or something like that, that you can look up when you go to bed at night. Like, for example, the Dhammapada. Yeah? Dhammapada is a short collection of 400 and what is it, 30, 430 verses or whatever it is. Yeah? And you just read a few verses every night before you go to bed, Yeah, just to remind you of the Dhamma, just to kind of bring a bit of... Uh, Joy and peace to your heart when you see uh, when you see the summary of the Buddha's teaching given in an inspiring way. That is a nice nice thing to do. Huh? But sometimes that is what we need to do because uh, I, I do recognize that for most people it is actually hard to read the suttas. Uh, the other thing that you can do, and I would recommend people to do, 
sometimes instead of listening to Dhamma talks, you can listen to Sutta readings, and, yeah? or at the very least, listen to Dhamma talks where the suttas are um, kind of mentioned or contemplated or thought about during the Dhamma talk. Yeah? Dhamma talks are very varied in their quality and what they are about. So uh, that is another way of doing it. So it gives you access to the sutta and it gives you a nice explanation, which hopefully is uh, also uh, inspiring. Yeah? Or you can, I mean, these sutta readings we're doing now are recorded. So if you find these inspiring, you can listen to them again yeah, down the track. Yeah? And, uh, and this is another way of doing it. Uh, because the thing about the Dhamma, a bit of repetition doesn't hurt uh, because you hear things, new things, and you see things in new ways uh, often when you repeat them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so something like that is probably maybe what I would recommend you to do now. Okay, yeah. thank you, Ajahn. But yeah. um, just curious, how did you start it? I mean, how did you start your journey when you first come to Sutta? How I started my journey? Yeah, I mean, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, long time ago when yeah. you're still lay yeah. practitioners like us, right? Yeah. How do you cross over when you started to cross over your, your initial period when you being introduced to Sutta? Yeah, I, I think for me it was the other way around. I think I became a monk first. That was me. I, I became a monk first, then I started reading suttas. That's, that's kind of how I did things. Because, uh, you know, I, the way it happened to me, I think I mentioned this before, that I probably was a monk in a past life. So, yeah, so in this life I just kind of followed my old habit, became a monk. <laughs> that's what I think would happen. Because uh, it's, for me it just happened very naturally. You know, being a Buddhist monk seemed like the right thing to do all the way along. Why should I not be a Buddhist monk? Yeah. And uh, then once I became a Buddhist monk and I realized it was a bad habit, I got worried. If it's just a habit, it's worrying. Maybe it's a trap. Yeah? Habits are usually a trap. I better read the suttas. That's how it kind of started. Yeah. And so I really got into the suttas and learning, teaching Pali. Ajahn Brahm taught me Pali and all of these kind of things. So. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, one more thing that your yeah. suggestions, right, on the sutta reading or recordings. Yeah. Um, one I could think of is maybe your, your sutta retreats, um, the past recordings. Is there any other um, recommended recordings that we could also look up for other than yourself? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we, w who else does nice sutta uh, B BSW in general? There's lots of sutta readings from, from a variety of... Uh, of uh, monastics on BSWA. Uh, uh, but yeah, when this Bhante Sujato is another one, I was just going to say that. Uh, so Bhante Sujato does a lot of sutta readings. Uh, Bikku, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi does sutta readings. Uh, uh, he speaks very slowly, so, but, if you, but if you can deal with it, then you, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't like too slow. I get, kind of, I get sort of uh, impatient if it's too slow. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, so those are some of the, some of the really, some of the good ones out there. I, I would really recommend those uh, because um, this is one of the great things about Ajahn Brahm. He, from the very beginning, he taught us to read suttas. Uh, yeah, in the early days when I was at, I came to Bodhinyana Monastery 30 years ago now, and he used to do sutta readings, yeah, when I came there. And I, that was, for me, it was an incredible eye-opener. It was like, wow. And he would do things like, you know, one sutta, and he would kind of draw in other suttas and show how it all kind of worked together. I was just really impressed when I heard that. Uh, and I realized this is what I want to do. This one. <laughs> and so I kind of went down that alley and I, I started doing suit and retreats. And that was, I had never met anyone who had done that before. And that was, that was really, uh, that was actually very, very positive thing, I think. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Very good. <laughs> yeah, Chad, follow up to the same question. Yeah. Should we do it? read from page cover to cover or we do it topical if we have to do sutta readings on our own um, go by topics thematical yeah I, you know yeah i would say read what you enjoy that's the most important thing yeah yeah enjoy what you're reading and i you know if you start in the majjhima nikaya and you go to the first sutta you probably put off straight away because the first sutta is so complex and so difficult. You want to understand a word of it, and you never open a sutta after that. So that's a, that's kind of a that's a bad one. So make sure you enjoy it. So if you don't like the first, I go to the second one. The second one is quite nice. Yeah, that's the Sabasava Sutta all the times. But by that one, go to the third one. It's called the Dhammadayada Sutta, the uh, being the, uh, the inheritance inheritors of the Dhamma. If you don't like that one, go to the fourth one, which is the Bayabhirama Sutta, the Fear and Dread Sutta, which is great. That's actually a, uh, that's a life story of the Buddha Sutta. Yeah? It's about how what he did before his awakening. And he went into the forest and had 
was frightened of this of thing. So that is a be- that's another beautiful sutta. So that's one thing you can do is go to all the suttas that talks about the Buddha's biography. Yeah, they are often very powerful and inspiring. Ayabhadava Sutta, Dvedavitaka uh, Vitaka Sutta, uh, Arya Pariesana Sutta, um, Mahasatchaka Sutta, uh, Majimalika 4, uh, 19, 26, 36. Uh, this is where you so these are all really inspiring suttas. So. But if you want to uh, study thematically, uh, you're better off buying a book like the, uh, the In the Buddha's Words by Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, where the suttas are collected according to theme. Yeah. Otherwise, it might be difficult for you to find the themes, yeah, because the suttas are so random. Uh, so that is a good place to start if you want to have thematically. And Bhikkhu Bodhi is always great. He's very kind of conservative. So he gives a good understanding of the Dhamma. Sometimes I don't agree with him. I have to admit, sometimes <laughs> that's just the reality of things. But generally speaking, he's very good. Uh, and uh, so in the Buddha's word, is a, is a good place to start. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. The word of the Buddha. Yeah, the word of the Buddha is nice. Yeah, that's kind of, and Ajahn Brahm has his own version of the word of the Buddha. That's exactly right. Yeah. 